Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our Honors Lecture Series on Governors this semester. And I have the good fortune and pleasure of organizing this series with Dr. Mary Evans, who is one of our resident honors faculty members, professor of history, and the director of the American Democracy Project on our campus. And uh, she will introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Dean Phillips, and welcome to everybody here for the very first day of MTSU's MT Engage Week. Um, welcome to the University Honors College and our Honors College um, engagement with our Native American, fellow American neighbors. As part of our Honors Lecture Series, Governors, Principles, Programs, Politics, and Policies that Govern, for today's panel for MT Engage Week, we will be talking about indigenous peoples and how they respond to U.S. governance. For this panel, the University Honors College would very much like to thank MT Engage and Dr. Mary Hofschwelle, the director of the MTSU MT Engage program, which this lecture series is very proud to be part of. And we invite everyone to a reception uh, immediately following the panel out in our lobby, um, also gratis of MT Engage. We would also like to thank uh, Ms. Linnell, um, sitting to my left, who teaches English as a second language to immigrant children at Reeves Rogers Elementary School just across Greenland drive from us. She's with Murfreesboro City Schools and she is a person who works daily with the Murfreesboro immigrant community toward intercultural dialogue. She is um, a leader of the Rutherford County Interfaith Council and she's a community leader in cross-cultural dialogue in our area. She's the person in fact who has organized this forum for today. Our panelists are Mr. Albert Bender, author of Native American Wisdom. He's a Cherokee Indian from Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. Bender attended the University of Oklahoma and received his law degree from the University of Kentucky. He's devoted his career to working with and representing Native American causes nationwide. He's an avid writer, and Mr. Bender's articles are social commentary on Indian culture and issues facing Native Americans that have appeared in a variety of local and national publications. He serves on the board of Native American Indian Association of Tennessee and he resides in Nashville with his wife, Melanie, and son, Jeff. He's a board member of the Native American Indian Association of Tennessee, an Eagle Award recipient presented by Tennessee Native American Eagle Organization, a group promoting Native American culture, traditions, and lifeways. He's a former chief tribal court judge and a former director of Native American tribal legal departments. Ms. Melba Chichote Eads, and I'm sure I've mispronounced that, Ms. Melba, so you'll correct me, is a wife, mother to four grown children, and a grandmother. She's an affiliate of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, coming from the tribal town of Big Spring Clan. She's been a nurse for almost 50 years and is a certified lay preacher of the United Methodist Church. She's been involved in preserving her family's history and telling the story of the Muscogee Creek. She's also a writer. She's written the Historical Heritage Landmark Criteria for Newtown Church, whose people walked the Trail of Tears and became members of the first Christ, one of the first Christian churches in the Oklahoma Indian Territory. And our moderator today is our own um, Dr. Ashley Riley Souza of the MTSU Department of History. She's an assistant professor at our Department of History. Her undergraduate degree was from the University of California, Davis. She's done graduate work at Portland State University in Oregon. Her PhD is from Yale in New Haven, Connecticut. Her research explores the ways that Native people and newcomers have coexisted and cooperated and the persistence of Native economic, political, and cultural structures and traditions in colonial settings. Dr. Riley Souza has published in the Journal of Ethnohistory and the Journal of Genocide Research. She has articles forthcoming in the Pacific Historical Review and in the collection of violence in indigenous communities confronting the past, engaging in the present. Um, Dr. Riley Souza teaches classes in Native American history, U.S. history, and most recently on the history of murder <laughs> in the MTSU Department of History. So I will pass the mic uh, and the program over to Dr. Riley Souza. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Um, it's a great honor to be here um, with you all today and especially with our two distinguished guest speakers, uh, Mr. Cote Eads and Ms. Mr. Bender. Um, and I think I'd just like to start off 
um, because I know both of our speakers have so much to say on this really fascinating topic. Um, just ask you for your, your opening thoughts on this question of Native American reactions to uh, American governance. And ladies first, we'll start with Mr. Kota Eads. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. His J is don't go is a greeting in my language. And um, uh, like I said, I'm a grandma, so, <laughs> you know, we'll, I have attended college, but not on a very high level. But when we come to sovereignty, um, sovereign, and this is from one of my tribal members, this is her quote, uh, Suzanne Schoen Harjo. She says, sovereignty is, treaties are, and nation to nation is between and among sovereign. So when I read that, I thought, okay. But we always talk about our sovereignty and it's in the research that I have been doing all of my life, of course, we have our own stories. Our stories are valid too, because they're us historical facts. We bring with us to the table our view, our point of view, our ways, and that's not necessarily a, a book way, <laughs> and it, but still very validated. So when we come to sovereignty, um, and of course all of our life we are told as tribal members, we are sovereign. We have sovereignties. Well, what does that mean? Well, when we go and look back in history, we understand the doctrine of discovery, and I'm not going to get into that because I think Albert's going to do a lot of that, carry that through. But, you know, we were discovered by Las Columbus, and uh, he did happen on our land, and from that day forth has been a total misunderstanding of who we are, our religious beliefs and traditions, our ways of living, and everything about who we were on this land by the, and I always have to say Miss Miriam Dunn called the first people here, the boat people. So the boat people really misunderstood us from the beginning and their laws and their ways were quite indifferent. Uh, and, it, and it led to many, many conversations. And of course we, we, we were as sovereignty, we had the ability to make treaties. And so we made treaties with um, other nations, all kinds of European nations before America, United States ever existed. So we already had that, you might say, under our belt. And we made proclamations of peace. Uh, we have, uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Washington, to the uh, Smithsonian of the American Indian, you will have to go up on the fourth floor and spend the entire day reading all the treaties. And as a Muscogee Creek person, the really first treaty, which, by the way, was uh, started by President George Washington. He actually had uh, the Creek delegation, which um, Alexander McGilkry led it up and brought about 2,000 Muscogee warriors into, then the capital was in Washington, was not in Washington, D.C., was in uh, New York. And they came and they had dinner with the president and he actually um, did this treaty. It's called the Treaty of New York, 1790. And a, about a year or so ago, that actual treaty was on exhibit there. So there's other actual treaties that you can see there if you ever get a chance. And you can see the peace medals. I, I have a medal on here, but it's quite small and it's a medal of when we got our government back in 1973. You see we, we walked the trail of tears. We lost our government or our so, so to speak sovereignty, which we never thought we lost it. And so we have this history of, of, of treaties. So in the beginning, Benjamin Franklin was quite impressed, inspired by the Six Nations and their uh, diplomatic uh, diplomacy and the way that they have made their, their treaties and their uh, 
alliances with each other for peace and sovereignty. So he writes in one of his little books that he did about that, that it, he says here, he says, I am of the opinion to secure friendships of the Indian is the greatest consequence for these colonies. So we started our relationship with the idea of sovereignty, with making peace, with maybe cooperation, but sadly that disappeared pretty fast, as, as you who are historians know. Um, so Benjamin Franklin uh, started that thought. Being Muscogee um, Creek citizen, I have sadly have to say the whole political view of, um, of us was a total defeat starting with succession of land, 1790 in that first treaty. Uh, the Creek delegation was so impressed with New York when they got back to their homeland, they named a town, a New Yorka, after New York. They were very impressed and said, wow, this is really town. So they, and today you can go to Oklahoma, just a few miles from Okmulgee, and you have New Yorka again, because all our towns with the removal are there in Oklahoma. So uh, we have a really sad political state. In, um, a lot of times we face as Muscogee people that our stories are not told because it was a total uh, uh, fake news about us even back then. Uh, I will say that with the murder of Chief McIntosh and, and the Treaty of Indian Springs, I believe that is um, 18, we've, I've jumped ahead from the Creek War. Of course, you know the Creek War. Andrew Jackson came down from Tennessee through the Coosa Valley all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, burning in, at each town along Alabama, only to end up with the treaty of Fort Jackson. Um, an unratified treaty is what I believe I was taught, but that could be wrong. Anyways, unratified treaties are made. They're sovereign agreements, and they are ratified, of course, by our Congress, and then signed by the president. Those are, that's what a treaty is. It's binding. And so the agreements go from there forth, supposedly. Uh, so that sovereignty and treaty making kind of go hand in hand together. So after... Uh, Incidentally, that treaty secession of 23 million acres of land in Alabama. However, a few years after that, we're talking, we're jumping ahead to 1826, 25, 1825, with the Treaty of Indian Springs, which of course many of you may already know the, ended in the demise of, of uh, William McIntosh. In, in his murder uh, from Coweta Town in Alabama. So those are, and, and so then after his murder, well, what you may not know that the governor of, of Georgia, which we're talking Alabama is just across the river from Columbus, Georgia. So the governor of, of Georgia was his first cousin, and that was um, Trump. Uh, troop, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> almost the same. But anyways, but he had a really uh, hard line. And of course, there was a government investigation on William McIntosh's murder, and which brought up all kinds of uh, agents, governors, uh, uh, and different agents of the gov federal government and also including, surprisingly enough, the missionaries, the missionaries. Missionaries had been coming into our land uh, because of the uh, Civilization Act. I believe that was 1819. 
the Native American or the Indian Civilization Act, the act of trying to make us civilize, which is sort of funny. <laughs> but um, so we have these things that went on in our ha past leading to being able to peacefully exist or coexist as friendly neighbors on our own land with the European people of America, United States. So, so, but one thing, and I, am I going too long? Well, one thing that really uh, I would like for you to, as young scholars searching back the history that has hardly been written about us, because I already told you about fake news, um, there's quite a bit of prejudice. After McIntosh's death, of course, another treaty was tried to be enacted because the treaty that he signed with his murder was null and void as far as the Creeks were concerned because they were not totally in agreement at the council meetings of the tribal towns that meet. And so another treaty proceeded and there was a lot of animosity toward the Indian people. And one surprisingly thing, we went from being sovereign nations that could hold our own on our land to the idea of occupancy. I'm sure you've heard that word just recently, occupancy. Excuse me. Occupancy instead of land ownership is quite a different thing. And as far as the European people were concerned, we probably didn't have the right to own anything because we were savages. We were hostiles from the Creek War. Tagabachi Town was still considered a hostile area, Upper Creek. Um, the, uh, the Treaty of Indian Springs was, of course, controversial, not only with the federal government. Of course, the governor of Georgia wanted it to remain because he wanted the, all of the land in Georgia. But the last lands of Georgia were finally succeeded with the, sex, with the next treaty that ca happened. And so that treaty became a hard part of our losing our heart, losing the last land of Georgia. I have to really know about Georgia because my family members were Hijiti, Hijiti, the mounds, the old mounds in Georgia or my fam would be my descendants land. The bones of my ancestors are buried there. And so Georgia would be, would have been their home. And they were already refugees over the Chattahoochee River, river into what is now, uh, would have been Kuwita town. So my great, great grandfather was Hijidi, was Wakoli, tribal town. And his, when he finally walked the Trail of Tears into Oklahoma, he married my great, great grandmother who was Kuwita. Kuwita town. So when you look at those towns and the, the idea of those towns, and surprisingly what I didn't know was when McIntosh called for the National Councils to come together to sign the treaty that led to his murder, the Treaty of Indian Springs, Swakoli town, Hijiti town, left in the night and did not sign. I didn't really know that. <laughs> that was a new thing for me to find out in some research that I did. So you're talking about red sticks, which red stick wars, red towns are war towns, white towns are peace towns. But one thing that really was interesting or maybe horrible to read, and I recently purchased this book and it's very all of, his, of this man, William Wynn, his research is still there in um, Columbus, at the University of Columbus, Georgia. And this is some of the things that he wrote about. But I had no idea about um, the secretary, um, Henry Clay, you know who he is in history. 
And the one thing, here we go, the Secretary of State, Henry Clay, and he surprised when the delegation went back to Washington to renegotiate the previous Treaty of Indian Spring, to renegotiate that treaty. He surprised the Congress by saying this, it was impossible to civilize Indians. There never was a full-blooded Indian who took to civilization. It was not in their nature. He also includes, he did not think them as a race, a race worth preserving. Essentially inferior to the Anglo-Saxon race, which were now taking their place on this continent, they were not an improvable breed. And their disappearance from the human family will not, will no, will be no great loss to the world. Will be no great loss. To, we're talking about my, my family. We're talking about my family here. We would be no great loss to the human world, according to the Secretary of State, Henry Clay. It's pretty, pretty powerful, pretty heartfelt stuff there. Actually, I felt offended when I read it, and then when I read it again today, I, I had to cry because it's really hard to think that. But we are still here. Um, the treaties, <laughs> every one of them that was made with over 600 American Indian nations have in some way or other been broken. And so we live today with the idea of sovereignty. We li also have the treaties that go on forever and ever as long as the grass grows and the rivers flow. I think there's a, a bigger word, pituitary, is that right? I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but anyways. So those treaties are supposed to go forever. And there's been a lot of talk today about our sovereignty, about those treaties, about occupancy, land ownership, you know, for, I can't talk for the other tribes, I can only say for my own. But when we went to Oklahoma, uh, after those trails, our own trails of tears, our own horror story of removal, when we got into Oklahoma, we set up our government, we set up our, uh, we, all, we actually even fought the, in the Civil War, which was horrible, of all the tribes or peoples that fought in that war, we're the only nation that lost land base, land base. Uh, we were forced to sign the Treaty of 1866 after the Civil War. We had to make our governments and our Constitution reflect the treaty <laughs> in some way. And it's pretty powerful. My great-great-grandfather happened to be a leader of that time, became the first elected chief of the Muscogee people. So he was very much involved. He was a full blood. He walked the Trail of Tears as a child. He was very involved in the political aspects after the Civil War and before he was a Biko. So he was a chief then. And so there was a lot of stuff and all the five tribes had to go through this. The ethnic cleansing of the Southeast is a horrible story has fought the five tribes, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole, and the Muscogee Creek people, all ethnic cleansed from this part of the land. We're talking about Tennessee. We're talking about ancestors buried here, these mounds here, Miss Mississippi and Muscogee and Chickasaw. We're talking about these people, our family. So it's a very hard story. So sovereignty and treaty rights are true. They 
still need to exist. It's, you know, 1.3 of the total population here on this land are American Indian. Can I ask you a follow-up question really quickly? I don't mean to cut off your train of thought, but I, I, do, I do have a follow-up question on that, that very interesting point about um, how treaty making and sovereignty uh, go together, because it seems that treaty making is, on one hand, from the Native perspective, the, from the perspective of Native nations, the main instrument of exercising sovereignty, right? You, you make treaties as nation-to-nation -nation agreements. Um, you try to enforce those treaties to be honored um, as, as a way of making sure that that sovereignty is respected. Um, but then again, treaty making is also, for the U.S. government, the main instrument of taking land from Native people. It's the main instrument by which the U.S. government um, gets, gets their hands on Native land. That, that's such a, um, such a tension there in, in treaty making. Um, uh, it's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. I, I like what you said because, you know, it brings up the land issue. What, what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about land. Give us back our land. If you're not going to keep our treaty, then return our land. And so that's where we could, we could follow that road, but you know that's not going to happen. We're in the process now. A tribe is being terminated because of land. 300 and something acres, the government wants to take that land. It's still happening. So land-based, you know, Doctrine of Discovery, Lost Columbus, and all the people after her came here for what? Land. So um, the question of treaty enforcement and, oh. and can, can we enforce treaties or, or get, get land back um, makes me think that we need a lawyer, um, which makes me think that we ought to uh, hand the floor over to Mr. Bender um, to, to chime in on this because um, this, I mean, treaty is law. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Well, one, treaty making is the basis of sovereignty. And when you talk about treaties, a treaty, and I'm speaking about it from also uh, treaties between sovereigns, but also from a, a legal standpoint, a treaty is a contract. And in order to have a valid treaty, you have to have what is called in law a meeting of the minds. In other words, both parties have to understand what is involved in the treaties or in a given treaty, and both parties have to agree on that. And so that is the basis of sovereignty. What has been a curtailment of sovereignty historically has been the doctrine of discovery. And for myself, I have early on been of the opinion that the doctrine of discovery is just um, ridiculous to be uh, put forth in this day and time. The doctrine of discovery is no more than a, a relic of uh, colonialism, feudalism, racial and cultural bias. The doctrine of discovery is based upon racism. The doctrine of discovery said that the sovereigns of Europe, in order to improve the world, they had to bring civilization and Christianity to non-white, non-Christian peoples. And as far as I'm concerned, I feel that my ancestors were highly civilized. In fact, in many ways, uh, more highly civilized than the invading Europeans. And also that we didn't need Christianity. I mean, for people who have Christianity, I think that's well and good, but myself, I'm not a Christian. I was a Christian for a brief period in my life when I was um, a teenager. I was a Catholic. But um, as I grew older into adulthood, I eschewed Christianity. But again, the uh, doctrine of uh, discovery is based upon the premise that we needed to be Christianized, we needed to be civilized. And I uh, will always maintain that we were always civilized. And what the doctrine of discovery said was, is that the European sovereigns, once they discovered the land, then they became the title holders to the land. And as Melba had said, we became occupants. Now, what does occupants mean? It means that our aboriginal right 
to the land or natural right to the land was extremely diminished to the point that as occupants, we didn't have title to the land anymore. And if you don't have title to the land anymore, then you can be expelled from that land by the sovereign that does have the title. And this started with a string of legal cases. The, one of the first was 1823 case called Johnson v. McIntosh. And I won't go into the details of all these legal cases because, you know, of time constraints. But there was Johnson v. McIntosh. Then there was the uh, very a seminal legal case, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, in which Justice Marshall said that Native American nations were domestic dependent nations. In other words, we weren't fully sovereign states. We were domestic dependent nations. And I've often wondered, when you think about it, what domestic dependent nations means. Because a lot of times the legalese that is put forth in these opinions is so nebulous that it leaves room for a lot of abuse of the people who are the subject of these particular legal decisions. Going forward from uh, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, uh, telescoping time, and going forward to what is considered the basis for what the U.S. uses as a reason or the legal premise for holding uh, control of our lands, is a um, case called U.S. v. Kagama, which was decided in 1886. And it said that the Congress has plenary power over Native American peoples, plenary power to the extent that the U.S. government can abrogate Native American treaties. But the question I've always had, and the question that a lot of other people in this field have, is that where does plenary power come from? Do you just kind of pull it out of the sky, so to speak? <laughs> and the U.S. jurists said, well, plenary power comes from the Commerce Clause, clause of the U.S. Constitution. What this cl Commerce Clause says is that the U.S. government has the right to regulate commerce between the states and the various Indian tribes. Now, how you go from regulating commerce, in other words, how I do business with uh, the U.S. government or the states to the point of controlling all aspects of my life as a Native American to controlling my life to the extent that you abrogate a treaty that my nation has made with the U.S. government, that doesn't make any sense. It is a jump that has no logical, legal explanation. But the U.S. government enforces treaties based upon not any logic, it's based upon force. If we do not abide by the treaties, or if we decide, well, look, uh, we think that MTSU here is built upon Cherokee land, so well, one day, to say tomorrow or the next day, we just decide that, hey, we're going to expel everybody from MTSU <laughs> and take back Cherokee land. Well, if we try to do that, the government moves in and says, well, we're going to send in the police or the army, and you guys are either going to be executed or you're all going to jail. So these treaties are based upon just raw force. And so when you reach that point in these uh, cases, you realize the illegality of what has taken place. I'll give you another one good example, and then I'm going to uh, uh, leave it open for questions and the like. There's the case, 1903 case, called Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock. And this is an Oklahoma case involving the uh, Kiowa Nation. The U.S. government decided, well, the Treaty of Medicine Lodge, which was decided in 1867, or which was made in 1867, we're going to abrogate that treaty and open up the Kiowa Reservation of two plus million acres for uh, white settlement. And the remaining land 
would be given to Kiowa tribal members at 160 acres per head of family. And as I said, the remainder would go to um, a white settlement. And so Lone Wolf, who was the leading Kiowa chief at the time, he took the matter to court saying, well, this is a fraud. This is a violation of the Medicine Lodge Treaty of 1867. The U.S. Supreme Court said, well, uh, we can abrogate the treaty based upon plenary power. In other words, an illegal power that they can't even find, U.S. jurists can't even find where it comes from other than to say it just exists. And so now we end up in the present day, and what Melba referred to as a tribe being terminated, that's the Mashpee Wampanoag in Massachusetts, just in the past couple of weeks, their lands reservation lands, which they were granted in 2010 under the Obama administration, the new head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Tara Sweeney, comes in and says, well, and she's a, a, a Trump appointee. She comes in and says, well, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe does not meet all the requirements under the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act. So based upon this, we're taking all your land back from you that you were granted in 2010. And again, I haven't had a chance to fully read the decision, but again, it makes no sense legally. So that's the kind of thing that, the kind of oppression that we've been under for all these years. And um, until we get a just government, which we haven't had a just government, and as far as I'm concerned, I've never had a president. Trump obviously isn't my president. <laughs> But we haven't been treated justly by any of the other presidents to the extent that we should have. But at any rate, I will uh, close at this point and um, the program will move on with questions of whatever from the, well, the students or whatever. Uh, I was interviewed not too long ago for a podcast um, and the issue was brought up of President Trump having the portrait of Andrew Jackson hanging in the Oval Office. Um, and so the, the interviewer was sort of like, well, how horrified are you? And I said, yeah, okay, pretty horrified. Um, I said, but when we think about it, which 19th century president would we have hanging in the Oval Office for the, um, the Navajo Code Talkers to be honored in their presence? Um, and I said, well, for that matter, which 20th century president would, <laughs> would we have a portrait hanging in the Oval Office? You know, um, So that point is really well taken. Um, I'm, I'm gonna assume that we've covered a lot of, a lot of territory and a lot of particulars about, uh, about Indian policy and, and Indian law that um, you might have questions about. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor to questions and answers. And what'll happen is um, you go ahead and ask your question and I'll kind of repeat it because I have a microphone here. Um, and then we can hopefully strike up a good conversation here. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, so my name is Jamie. My question's kind of long. I'm very sorry, I wrote it down. So um, I've become aware that many history books that are studied in public schools throughout the U.S. do not properly disclose and do not accurately disclose the hardships that the European invaders forced on the, your people. Um, so in fact, they point out, they paint it as though, um, uh, sorry, hold on. <laughs> uh, they paint it as though the Native Americans gladly moved to new parts of the country and just willingly gave up their land. They don't talk about the Trail of Tears. They don't talk about the forced assimilation, um, the breaking of the treaties by the US government. Um, so what more can we do as a younger generation of Americans to ensure that the struggle forced upon your people is not forgotten? I'm, I'm gonna abridge that. Um, I, I will not repeat that. Um, so Jamie, <laughs> that's okay. That, that sounds like one of my questions. Um, so, so Jamie asks then, um, how, how do, the, uh, how does the younger generation then make make sure that these stories are told, that this is what um, children learn about when they learn their country's history? Well, I think one is the educational system. And one, uh, responding to your question is that, and, and this is something that we haven't really had the chance to, opportunity to properly address, but over the years, myself and Melba have talked about this in terms of the educational system right here in Nashville, Tennessee, right here in the state of Tennessee, that this is something that needs to be addressed, that the school board needs to be approached 
with information to put into the school books so that children will get a true understanding of the history of what happened to Native American people. And that's one thing that can be done. And the other thing that can be done is um, contacting your representatives, getting involved in the struggles of Native American people. And I would add this, uh, myself and Melba, we've been involved in organizing demonstrations out at the Hermitage to protest the adulation that has been given to Andrew Jackson over the years. And um, we've had a number of demonstrations over the years about this particular president. And I would say um, keep your eyes and ears open about when we're having things like this and come out and uh, give us support. And again, I would like to say is getting information, the right information to the educational system. And, and that reminds me, uh, it was mentioned earlier that I'd written a book. This book is called Native American Wisdom, and this book is a small encyclopedic version of kind of a Native American um, Ripley's, believe it or not. It has like tons of information, about a thousand different entries about our contributions to U.S. society. For example, first postal workers were Native American people who delivered mail between Albany and Buffalo, New York in 1672. The first spork, combination spoon and fork, was invented right here by Native Americans in the Cumberland River Valley a thousand years ago. That's the kind of information that needs to get. I also uh, just kind of um, interesting, uh, comical, well not comical information, but things that people enjoy is that country hams were invented by Cherokees. <laughs> And that's in the book. Also, on a more serious note, the uh, freedom afforded women in the Iroquois culture was used as a model for the women's suffrage movement in the U.S. in the early uh, 20th century. These are the kind of things that need to get out and things that need to go into the history books. I don't know whether Melba wanted to also respond to that question. Well, I'm so glad. Albert and I, we, we, we moved to Tennessee about the same time, and we've been... I always say I have my foot in my mouth and it fits so nicely there. But, uh, you know, um, just, I will say this. You have to keep telling your stories. Storytelling is how we learn. Oral traditions is how we can continue. And just last, two weeks ago, um, Muscogee Creek citizens came over from from, Oak, from uh, Bigsby in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, to come with me on my Trail of Tears walk that I do annually every year. And they brought some youth. One of them was my cousin, I guess she is 18, just graduated from high school. And so they, we had three young women that came with them this time. And we went to some of the sites there in Woodbury along the Northern Trail. And we went to the sign, we went to a witness house, we came down here to the uh, Stone River Battleground, which is also a Trail of Tears site. And so we kind of did some history. Well, it was surprising to me that these young Muscogee women did not know our story. They were kind of sketchy about it, but you know, they're a product of the American education system, so they didn't, get, they didn't get all the story, except they all hopped in the car and came over here to be here, to sing Muscogee hymns, to pray on our land, and to remember. And so they went back with a totally <coughs> different idea of who they are after removal, because we, you know, we are not from Oklahoma. We just happened to get there we didn't mean to go there. Our homelands are here. So my, my thought and my heart is that we return. We return to our lands. And we are coming back every year. Uh, the Cherokees have a bicycle ride to memorialize their Trail of Tears. And um, then so on the Northern Trail, which goes through Woodbury, Tennessee, down through here and up through Nashville and on up to Kentucky and Illinois. So th these, these places are real. The people were real. They walked here. 
So I, I think you're on the right path being in this, this little talk we're having here because there's so much more to learn. Dig in there and find it. But our education system um, is very, you know, there's a lot of history they have to cover in the few years of, of, of our school, say in high school, for instance, four years. So they're, they're moving on. And, um, you know, we have to be mindful of our stories and tell them over and over again so they don't get forgotten. Not, not everybody can read every book, but you can listen. You know, we listen to the television, we listen to the radio. We can listen to our stories being told. Thank you. Other questions? Oh my gosh. Okay, so I caught peripheral vision. Go ahead. Okay, um, I apologize. I know this is kind of a sensitive topic, but I just, could y'all talk a little bit about um, intergenerational trauma and how like the way that you were treated by our government government has affected maybe like you, your families and your personal lives? It's a good question. Intergenerational trauma. Well, inter intergenerational trauma, um, well, it's something that myself growing up, I thought about on a, a daily basis because being Cherokee, I was always aware of the fact that we fought a long war right here in this Middle Tennessee area in East Tennessee to stop the Europeanization of this land. From 1776 to 1794, under our war chief J Dragon Canoe, whom I've written a number of articles in uh, historical um, uh, quarterlies in the newspaper and the like over uh, the years, we fought um, a terrific horrific battle to uh, stop white settlement of this area. And I have to also be mindful of the fact that my great-great-grandfather, he died fighting white settlers. And he didn't die running from them. He took all the bullets right in the front, right in his chest. He died facing the enemy. And I was raised up with those kinds of stories. And so uh, the intergenerational trauma leads for, I'd say, a, a lot of bitterness on the part of those of us who realize what happened and realize the injustice of it all. But uh, again, it's something that, you know, impels us to do a lot of things like myself, you know, get, staying involved in Native American uh, affairs, writing this little book. And, all, and before I forget, this... Uh, book is available and anybody who's interested in ordering one can see me after this is all over. It's a very affordable price and um, it will give you also a greater idea of the contribution and just so many facts about uh, what we've contributed to this society aside from the conflict that we've had to engage in with the society. But intergenerational trauma it's something that's talked about in a lot of the Native American newspapers. In fact, one of the newspapers that I write for, uh, it's a constant theme of intergenerational trauma and the fact that it makes us a lot of times very bitter and very angry about what happened. And a lot of us end up uh, getting involved in things that we shouldn't get involved in that are a spinoff of what happened to us for these hundreds of years. Well, intergenerational trauma, I think recently I heard it was in our DNA, but um, you know, we, ha we have these stories, uh, we have boarding schools, we haven't touched on that. Um, my grandfather went to Carlisle Indian School. Carlisle Indian School was the, one of the first boarding schools and it, the uh, Apaches were taken from Florida up there. Uh, I think it was to a, a black college, Miriam. I'm probably forgetting that now. But anyway, it was Hampton yeah, Hampton, Hampton, yes, Hampton Institute, and then later, uh, Carlisle was a military army base, and so my grandfather went to school at an army base. He dressed in a uniform, and he was there four years before he went back to Okmulgee, Oklahoma, and. Um, 
the, the, during the summer when school was out, he was a forced laborer. He went to a farm and he was a farm attendant. He worked on the farm. He went there when he was about 13. And so he was, you know, at 13, he was working in a farm. And, um, and th they, were, they were called outings. And you, can, you can go on the side of Carlisle. This, uh, in fact, in two weeks, uh, Carlisle will be having their journeys seminar, and they'll be talking about that. But, you know, I, I went with my father. My father was a Navy military. He, uh, he, he loved the Navy, and he left Okmulgee, Oklahoma for the Navy. And so I grew up with him in the Navy and, and then back to Oklahoma. But we went to Carlisle because I, I wanted to go see the school or the site of the school, and there's several graves. They moved the graves from the original places, and in doing so, they got the, the bodies and the tombstones mixed up. And so they all have military white tombstones now, and, and that little graveyard is right in front of the PX. So if you've been in the military, you know that's the, the store, the, the department store for the military. Well, my dad and I, we walked through that graveyard and we looked at every grave in every nation of children that died without seeing their home, their mother, their father, or any of their family members before their death. We read every nation there. And as we went out the gate, of course, there's medicine ties in the, in the trees. There's piles of pennies and pile of quarters. So as we went out the gate, I said, Dad, here's you a quarter. And I said, I'm digging for myself a quarter. And he said, don't put that quarter there. I said, why not, Dad? He said, you, you walk away from here and don't you ever look back. I felt very shocked because my dad said, don't look back at this place. He too went to boarding school. And so I told him I was sorry that I now belong to a bridge generation. I was going to leave my quarter there. And so I left a quarter, but he's gone now. When I heard him say, walk away from this place and never look back, that's iteration trauma. And it was given to me by him. Thank you. I saw, oh, yes, back in the back. Um, so it seems uh, no great exaggeration that your peoples and many other have faced great suffering at the hands of the state um, over the years. So why do you continue to advocate for political involvement? Why are you waiting for a just government? Uh, what makes you think the institution of the state will treat you fairly now? Well, as we've been pointing out, our sovereignty is directly related to independence with the government. We receive funding federal funding, and then we have tribal funding. So as me, a, a tribal living, living at large, some of that funding my tribe can help provide to me. And some of the funding we can't touch because it's federal and it's treated and it's there in our borders of Oklahoma, which nobody mentioned the Dawes Act. You really have to get into that to see the travesty and, and the loss of land it, uh, Albert mentioned 160 acres. Uh, you know, the Kiowa people aren't very many people, so you know, you, you take two billion acres, you give everybody 160, you got a, maybe a billion and something left over. The same with the last tree, uh, the last census of the Muscogee people, uh, 1882, um, I believe. My great great grandfather fought, they wanted to do it in 1880. He said, no. No, he was principal chief, so he's, he, he postponed that. Well, he wasn't the chief in 1882. The reason for the census was to find out how many people were left because they already had their eye on our border. 
you look at the old map of Oklahoma, you can see the five civilized tribe had, had lands given from our lands in the east that's supposed to last forever and ever. And the Dawes Commission wiped all that out. Subsequently, we lost our governments again, which President Nixon gave us back our governments in uh, 1973. So, you know, that's been a trial. But today, we have to meet with the president. We have to meet with Congress over our budget. And go online. You can read this. You can go on any internet. And you can listen about the Native people, what they need in the budget. Well, the budget's been cut 10% 10, 10 this year. There was already a backlog of needs, such as school, such as border security, and other things. So you can go online and listen to every, all these nations come with their request for the budget. It's sovereignty for you. Also, the whole point of fighting for a just government is, I'll put it like this. Um, we may lose a fight, but at least we won't lose it by default. In other words, you know for sure that with the kind of government we have, that if you don't fight, you know you're going to lose. If you do fight, there's a chance that you're going to get something out of that government that is justly yours. So that was the whole question of why wow, there were so many Indian wars. A lot of times people knew that they couldn't win, but the whole idea was the honor of fighting for what you believed in would be passed on to your descendants and that they would continue the fight. No matter, and I re remember, and this is a quote from a Muscogee Creek lady that I read, it, it was, uh, and I forget exactly where I read it at, but she said, we're going to continue this fight, and if we have to fight for a thousand years, we're going to continue this fight, and we're going to win. So we are running a little bit low on time, but this gal here in the back has been so patient, and I want to make sure we get to her question. I have a really simple, lighthearted question. Um, I also am, I have an ethnic background, and so I have traditions that not a lot of people know about. What are your favorite traditions that you're passing on to your kids that I probably have no idea that you guys do? So. That's a wonderful finish up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I have to always say this. We've been aculturized assimilated and Christianized. <laughs> so our traditions may not still be the same. When we came from the east to the west, we carried our fires. We started our fires anew, uh, which would be our ceremonial grounds. It was always said that uh, when all the fires go out, that's the end of the world. I think a Muscogee Creek fires are about 19, 16 at this time. So we had mm, 29, 40 something at removal. You can see we're getting at the end of the world now. So, um, but at those grounds, we still practice our medicine and our, our New Year and we have green corn and that starts in the summer. We have our stomp dance. And so there, we, we still have those things, but not everybody participates. But some people do, and some are coming back to that. I, I know my dad, uh, his, his father was an Indian, all full-blood Indian preacher, and, his, and my dad's older brother was, a, you know, his, his children were my dad's age. And he took my dad to a stomp dance, and they, they dance all night till the morning. Well, a time came. My daddy wasn't back for Sunday school, and my, my grandfather, who is the preacher, was like, okay, this kid is in trouble. And so when they got back, uh, well, this is how my dad said, that was my first and last stomp dance. <laughs> so, because he couldn't miss church that next day. Oh. Yeah, I would like to say, on, for my part, uh, my son 
He, uh, right now, is thinking about going to law school and getting into Indian law. So, you know, we'll pass that on and he'll be doing what I've been doing and also practicing our cultural traditions. So that's what I'm doing. And since we're getting ready to close, I want to remind people again, if anybody's interested in ordering a copy of the book, <laughs> see me after this is over. I want to thank our panelists and our moderator very much. And because we do have a reception out in the lobby, um, please come introduce yourself to Ms. Melba and Mr. Bender and ask questions directly to them.